The final chapter in the Kamigawa block, and the final set ever to take place on the plane of Kamigawa, at least until Kamigawa Neon Dynasty releases in early 2022, Saviors of Kamigawa came out in June of 2005 and featured a Toro, a type of lamp, as its set symbol. The set concludes a story that originated in Champions of Kamigawa and continued on through Betrayers of Kamigawa. If you like, you can check out the Scott Mago book, Guardian, Saviors of Kamigawa. And as per usual, we have a story summary already ready already. Ready? Ready. The story picks up with Michiko, daughter of the land's daimyo, Kanda, back in the Jukai forest, living amongst the Kasune. She sends a kanji message to Toshiro, the ronin who acts as her guardian and protector. He replies, stating that he's a bit on the busy side, but will come to her aid when the time is right. Meanwhile, the capital, Aiganjo, has fallen, Kanda is missing, and the Suratami are aggressively taking over all of Kamigawa. Back at the Manamo Academy, Toshiro witnesses the all-consuming Oni of Chaos, the most powerful of Oni, devouring the school's library. Knowing that the Oni could easily consume the artifact originally stolen by Kondo from the Okagachi, the most powerful of Kami, he regrets bringing it to the school. He would teleport away with it, but he has previously been forbidden from taking it with him into the realm of the Myojin of Night's Reach. Hitsugu, his ogre blood brother, catches up with the Ronin, informing him that the Oni he had summoned for their cause is already wreaking havoc within the Suratami city above the academy. He then asks Toshiro to fully commit to their pact. But the Ronin is not quite so eager. He likes his independence and finds it more advantageous to play his alliances against one another. The two depart, with Toshiro teleporting away on his lonesome, but not before it becomes clear that a rift has grown between the once good friends. He soon appears in Numai, a once prospering city within the swamps of Kamigawa that is now home to crime lords and cult-like wizards. He finds an acquaintance and Hyozen blood sister of his, Kiku, as the only survivor from her wizarding clan after an attack from the Soratami. Apparently, when the Moonfolk attacked, her peers infused her with a powerful shadow magic. The infusion, however, turned out to be more like a curse, as the power had been increasingly driving the woman insane. She asked Toshiro for help, and the Ronin is able to assist her in calming her mind. The two enjoy a night of intense romance, and, in the morning, she finds that she is free of the shadow curse, a curse that Toshiro infused into a ceramic tile in the event that it proves useful at some point in the future. Promising to release her from her Hyozen Oath, he convinces Kiku to assist him further. They locate their fellow Hyozen Oath brother, Meronawar, and the three head out, bound for the ruined capital. They arrive in Aiganjo, where they steal a rider moth, then venture back to Manamo to reclaim that which was taken, the mysterious Kami artifact, and fly it to safety. The trio arrive back at the academy. Shortly after they get there, they are attacked by the all-consuming Oni of Chaos. The Ronin uses the powers granted upon him by his patron, the Myojin of Night's Reach, and is able to drive the demon spirit away. That's when Hitsugu, now considering Toshiro disloyal and an enemy, turns his personal attention to them. Before he can act, however, Kanda arrives along with his ghost army attacking the academy. The ogre shaman is forced to divert his attention and efforts away from Toshiro and towards this new threat, sending his Oni army against Kondo's forces. This leaves Hitsugo and only two of his Yamabushi warriors against Toshiro and Kiko, Meronawa currently separated from the pair. The ogre tells Toshiro that he knows that he has walked away from his oath of Hayozan. Hearing this, Kiku switches sides from the Ronin to Hitsugu. Her now on his side, the ogre then informs them that when he created Hayozan, he also inserted a way with which the blood brethren can be slain without breaking the pact. He demonstrates by choking out Kiku before grabbing hold of Toshiro as well. That's when Meronawa rejoins the group, having been brought back due to the burning of his own Hyozen mark. Witnessing the Ogre Shaman killing his Hyozen brethren, and thus, assuming his Hyozen oath having now been broken, seeing as he missed out on the whole there's a clause bit, the rat stabs Hitsugo in the eye, causing the Ogre to drop both Kiku and Toshiro. From the fall, the tile holding Kiku's shadow curse shatters, and the powers flow back into her. As for Meronawar, 
his Hayozen status was actually still very much in effect, and he finds the wrath of the oath falling upon him as consequence. Toshiro attempts to save the Nozomi from the consequences of the oath by cutting off the tattoo, but the wrath continues to burn. Meanwhile, Kiku goes for the kill and attacks Hitsugo with her shadow magic. Not wanting her to suffer the same fate as Meronawar, Toshiro stops her from ending the shaman. The ogre fights back, besting Kiku. Then a weakened Toshiro takes an opportunity to stab the shaman in his other eye, blinding him before collapsing, feeling himself near death. It's about this time that he prays to the Myojin of Night's Reach to save him. His patron responds, saying that he already has what he needs to be saved. Through a crack in the wall, he sees that the Okagachi has now arrived at Manamo, and that Hitsugo's patron, the all-consuming Oni of Chaos, was doing its best to flee from it. The injured Ronin describes what's happening to his blinded former friend. The ogre's spirit breaks, agreeing to let the Ronin and Kiko go in peace if he uses his shadow teleportation to send the ogre to the Honden of Chaos so that he can punish his patron Oni for its cowardice. Toshiro agrees and sends the ogre away, then does similar for Kiku, sending her back home to Numai before mercy killing Meronawar, who is writhing in agony. Ronin then reclaims that which was taken and climbs upon his stolen moth mount and, in shadow, flies to Jukai. Speaking of Jukai, the forest is under attack from the Soratami who are using the cover of the Kami War to conquer the plain and remake it on behalf of the smiling Kami of the Crescent Moon, Mochi. Once Toshiro arrives, he is almost immediately captured once again by the Orochi, the snake people also now taking possession of the powerful Kami artifact. He witnesses them summon forth the dragon spirit, Jugun, in defense against the Soratami. The Ronin manages his escape and locates the extra planar artifact, only to discover that the Orochi guarding it have all been turned to salt. He yet again reclaims it, though this time the artifact begins speaking to him, saying things along the lines of, Release me. Very soon after, Toshiro begins seeing visions of all the bad things he has done in his life. Initially, the Ronin feels no remorse, but as he begins seeing visions of his actions with Meronawar, Kobo, and Hitsugu accusing him of being an oathbreaker, he begins to wear down. This is when the warlord, Godo, happens upon the anguished Ronin. He tells Toshiro that the Yuki Ona spirits are still ravaging the Sokenzan Mountains on Kamigawa's borders, but that the Ronin can still make amends with them. Leaving that which was taken behind in the forest, Toshiro teleports away, bound for the mountains. Mochi, in the meantime, begins herding the remaining Orochi into harm's way, hoping the Okagachi will consume them all. Now in the mountains, Toshiro is confronted by Night's Reach. The Myojin reveals to the Ronin that he is being manipulated, but that she is not yet ready for her presence to become known to Mochi in the Soratami. Toshiro makes peace with the Yokiona, then departs from the mountain's snowy slopes. Back in Jukai, Konda and his ghost army arrive. He briefly considers saving the Orochi from their demise, but his attention shifts once he senses the location of his prized stolen artifact. He sends most of his ghostly soldiers to attack the Soratami while keeping a small contingent at his side while he goes to claim that which was taken. Okagachi, now also knowing where its stolen artifact lies, also begins heading in the same direction. Toshiro appears on scene next to that which was taken and sees Kanda and his forces quickly approaching from one direction and Okagachi doing the same from another. He takes hold of the artifact and does exactly what he was told not to do with it. He teleports into the realm of Night's Reach. The Myojin is furious at Toshiro for such an action, saying Okagachi will follow the Ronin into her realm after the artifact. She goes to cast Toshiro out, but the disc-shaped artifact shoots a bolt of energy at her, puncturing the Myojin's mask. This causes her to flee, ejecting the Ronin from her realm and taking the power she had granted him away. Toshiro then finds himself back in Jukai, not far from the Kitsune camp where the princess, Michiko, is staying. The Kitsune elders attempt to communicate with the artifact, while others attempt to free whatever is trapped inside. The Ronin feels pessimistic about how such actions will turn out, and convinces Michiko to simply touch it, 
feeling that she and whatever is inside the artifact are somehow tied together. Her protector, Pearl Ear, protests, but Okagachi appears in the sky above them, leaving them little choice. Before Michiko touches it, the Ronin secretly draws in her hands the kanji for sister and union. She touches the artifact, freeing the spirit that has been trapped inside. It manifests as a multicolored scaled human. They call her the Taken One, a name she rather dislikes. Toshiro then suggests the name Keodai, meaning sibling, a name the spirit then adopts as her own. Keodai and Michiko then teleport away so that they can have a moment to talk. Both fearful of their fathers, Kondo for Michiko and Okagachi for Kyodai, the two decide that they are stronger together, stating, quote, The old must stand aside for the new. Sisters in spirit, the two merge and return to the world as an entity known as the Sisters of Spirit and Flesh. They end Kokagachi, the most powerful of Kami. Right after, Konde shows up and the merged sisters petrify him, keeping him alive as naught but a statue. The sisters then take Okagachi's place in the stars, warning the mortals that the Kami War will continue until all Kami realize there is no more reason to fight, as their worlds have now been blended. Mochi, realizing that the stakes have greatly changed, appears before the sisters and attempts to curry their favor. Kiyodai and Michiko would have none of it, however, and open a gate to the realm of the all-consuming, out of which Hitsugu, who had defeated and consumed the all-consuming Oni of Chaos for its previous cowardice, emerges, only to tear the smiling Kami of the Crescent Moon apart. Everything now having calmed down, Toshiro departs and walks right into a trap. He is mortally stabbed by a vengeful Soritami. Before he could perish, however, Knight's Reach appears and teleports the Ronin away. As they travel, she confines in him that the Kami War not only weakened the barrier between Kamigawa's spirit world and mortal world, but the barriers between Kamigawa as a whole and other planes altogether, allowing her to travel amongst them. She then forgives the Ronin for disobeying her by bringing that which was taken into her realm before dropping him off on a new world. Taking in his new home for the first time, he takes note of two huge spires of rock just off the coast in the distance questioning their purpose. The Myojin then explains to him that the land he stands upon is ruled by a powerful queen who sees herself as a goddess and that he is a gift not just to her, but to the world as a whole. As a backhanded parting gift, Knight's Reach takes the Ronin's vision from him, then departs. Alone on a new world, a blinded Toshiro smells the familiar scent of Swampland and begins a new life on a new plane one he would later learn is called Dominaria. And thus ends the Kamigawa block and the story of the Kami War. But there is so much more to tell not just of saviors of Kamigawa as a set, but of how the block overall was conceived and constructed. It's a lot to take in. In mid-2002, while the development of Miraden was going full speed ahead, the Kamigawa block, which sets at the time were codenamed Earth, Wind, and Fire, was being concepted. Bill Rose, vice president of Wizards R&D, decided they should do a set in which flavor was just as important as mechanics, if not more so. And it should be done in a real world setting that was familiar to people, unlike the highly stylized metallic world of Mirrodin. The team tossed around a number of ideas, including the mythologies of the Greeks, Celts, Sumerians, and so on. After attending a distributors meeting in Tokyo, Japan, Rose made up his mind. They were going to base this new block off of Japanese mythology. Of course, this proved easier said than done, as Japan does not have a mythology in the Western sense per se. Rather, there's folklore, and the old gods of Japan are still very much relevant in Buddhism and Shinto. Then there's the fact that, aside from samurai and ninjas and whatnot, Westerners do not really know a whole lot about ancient and feudal Japan. Plus, Many who do know more than the average Westerner tend to confuse ancient Japan with ancient China and Korea. Then there's the whole magic part of magic. The creatures, entities, and values of Japanese folklore are so complex and bizarre that they do not cleanly fit into magic's five colors as well as, say, 
taking inspiration from Arthurian tales. Still, Wizards of the Coast decided to do a top-down Japanese-inspired set, but they had to be respectful of the culture and history while still making it fit into Magic the Gathering. What they decided upon was focusing largely on Shinto, which, in simple terms, incorporates the worship of ancestors and nature spirits, along with a belief that a secret power, Kami, exists in both animate and inanimate things. Though, being Watsi, they gave it a little twist. Essentially, Shinto gone wrong. Oh my Shinto god, are you kidding me? Actually creating the cards, however, would prove quite a daunting task. Due in part to all of the additional research that had to be done, card design began months later than it should have. And once card design did begin, each design team member had a different interest and focus. There were difficulties creating good common cards, as the more interesting and fun to design cards tended to be of higher rarities and complexity. 20 some odd combat focused keyword mechanics were designed before they finally settled on Bushido. And then there were the legendary creatures, which is a whole mess of its own. In short, things did not mesh together quite as easily as everyone had hoped. And yet, despite the Kamigawa sets not being all that well received at the time, nor really selling all that well compared to other sets of their time, players really looked back fondly at the set because, if Wizards got nothing else right, the flavor was ultimately appreciated. An explosion of flavor! Of course, that's not to say that there isn't anything good to be said about the cards themselves. Specific to Saviors of Kamigawa, which carried over Splice and Arcane from the first two sets, as well as the flip cards, Soul Shift, Bushido, and Focus on Legendary Creatures, there is also a theme of creatures and spells that get better as the player's hand size increases, such as Aki Underling and Kitsune Boonsetter. Saviors also introduced three new abilities. Sweep, spells with abilities that scale up depending on the number of specific lands you return to your hand upon cast. Channel, a creature ability that can be used from a player's hand by paying a cost and discarding said creature. And Epic, which appears in a cycle of rare sorceries that prevent the caster from playing any more spells for the rest of the game, but keeps copying itself during each of its controller's upkeep until the game ends. So I got that going for me, which is nice. And on the topic of cycles, this small set had a whopping nine of them, epics included. Probably most noteworthy are Ascendants, which are rare legendary flip cards that start out as a creature and then flip into a legendary enchantments, such as the card Arayo Sorotami Ascendant, changing from a 1-1 flyer into an enchantment that automatically counters the first spell played by each opponent each turn. Ghostlit creatures, each of which have both a normal activated ability as well as a channel ability that hits twice as hard, and Kirin, legendary flying creatures that have an ability that fires off whenever you play a spirit or arcane spell, such as with Celestial Kirin, which destroys all permanents with a converted monocost equal to that of the spirit or arcane spell being cast. In terms of noteworthy singles, Saviors of Kamigawa had a few that performed well in the tournament scene. That would include hard-hitting creatures such as Kagamaro, First to Suffer, Maga, Traitor to Mortals, and Arashi, The Sky Asunder. None of those cards, however, found their way into Antoine Rule's 2005 Pro Tour Los Angeles winning Psychotog deck. In fact, only one card from the entire set was used by Rule, a single copy of Aboro, Palace in the Clouds. Antoine Ruel wins Pro Tour Los Angeles. Still, Saviors of Kamigawa found a place with high-quality sideboard cards and a couple of other singles of note. Of course, there's a sideboard staple, Pything Needle, which is still extremely common in today's competitive decks. The anti-equipment card, Manriki Gusari, and the anti-artifact card, Kataki, Wars Wage, were also, at one point, extremely common sideboard inclusions. There's also the aforementioned Irayo Sorotami Ascendant, which is rather formidable in EDH until the card was banned in the format, first as a commander, then altogether. Finally, the uncommon artifact, Ebony Al Natsuke, is worth a mention, as it's the namesake of a once popular and still fun to play deck known as Owling Mine. Wait, seriously? Which, when paired with the old school card Howling Mine, I get it now, became a win condition by filling an opponent's hand and dealing four or more damage to them per turn, depending on how many owls you have in play. So is Saviors of Kamigawa one of your favorite Magic the Gathering sets? 
If so, let us know in the comments section here on YouTube. And please pop a buck in our Patreon tip jar to support more great Magic the Gathering content.